Our reading of God's Word is taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, chapter 4. Philippians, chapter 4. Reading from the first verse, let us hear the word of God. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odius, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow labourers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation or gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica he sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odour of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of his holy scriptures. I want to take for my text... Two verses that we read together in the passage, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, 
with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In the modern versions, uh, this reads like this, the NIV reads like this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I wonder if in about a hundred years' time your name was discovered, perhaps mentioned in some old document. I wonder what one thing would you like the finder to learn about you? Would you like to be recorded that it re would you like it to be recorded that you were uh, a person uh, who was kind and gracious and loving? Or that you were uh, a prayerful person, a faithful Christian? Or what would you like to be remembered? What virtue or quality, Christ-like quality, would you like to be remembered for? Well, two ladies uh, from the church at Philippi have gone down in history. And the thing they're remembered for is that they'd fallen out with each other. And no one knows what the, uh, these women disagreed about. And Paul didn't say what the problem was. Although it seems that everyone else in the church seemed to know what the trouble was. Uh, it must have been going on for some time because the Apostle Paul had heard about it in Rome. Far away is Rome. And so we hear about these two women and we find that the apostle was very concerned about it. He was anxious about it because he mentions them by name in this letter to the church at Philippi to actually name the two ladies. Someone has said a good, the prover, in Proverbs, uh, Solomon said that a good name is better than precious ointment. And uh, the difficulty in this situation that uh, a trouble like this brings a cloud over the church. And these things flare up very quickly sometimes. And most of these altercations that arise in the church arise out of a, a selfish spirit. They happen because people are concerned uh, to have their own way. Rather than following in the spirit of Christ, let his mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself. And it's usually one or another insisting on their own rights. And uh, James picks up the same theme when he asks, What causes fights among you? And he gives the reason. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something and you don't get it. And if you take a close look at these two people, uh, the situation had to be resolved. It had to come to a head and be resolved. And... Uh, he speaks in the first verse, the Apostle, about standing fast. Well, united we stand, divided we fall. And so this situation was a desperate situation. But Paul refuses to take sides. He addresses one and then the other. I beseech you, Odius, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And he uses the, uh, the same tender terms. I beseech you. He implored them to be of one mind. And then he mentions this true yoke fellow. We don't know who that is. Commentators are not agreed as to who this man was, but might have been and probably it was Epaphroditus. And he says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. No one was better than Epaphroditus to uh, exercise a conciliatory influence over this situation to pour oil on troubled waters. And uh, you notice what Paul says. He says of them, help them. These women labored with me in the gospel. They were too valuable to the work of God. 
to uh, be rendered, uh, rendered in, ineffective or redundant. And uh, this tragedy of such a situation is this, that it affected the work of God. It affected the prayer life of the church and affected their own prayer life, obviously. And uh, Paul saw and felt the seriousness of this situation. And he did care very much. He cared for all the churches. He tells us elsewhere, the care of the churches come upon me daily. He was very much concerned. He wasn't careless in any sense of the term. He was very concerned. But he wasn't full of worry. He wasn't full of feverish anxiety. On the contrary, uh, he was concerned about the situation. He was concerned about himself at this time. He was a prisoner at Rome, and his trial was coming up soon, and death was imminent. That wicked man Nero was exerting a terrible influence over the Christians at this time. And his trial was coming up soon. Death was imminent. And he was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day under close scrutiny and not able to preach the gospel. What frustration for this great man of God, this probably the great, greatest world's church planter. Here he was uh, in prison uh, and in this awful situation. And uh, he doesn't give way to anxious, anxious care. He doesn't fret. He doesn't fume. What does he do? Well, on the contrary, in spite of the danger and the discomfort, Paul overflowed with joy. And he knew that even in prison, there were certain things in his life that he could rejoice over. That God is the sovereign God. Rejoice in the Lord always, I say. And again, I say, rejoice. And he could rejoice in the Lord. He couldn't always rejoice in the actual thing that was happening to him. But I say again, he was filled with joy and with peace. And in spite of these things then, Paul doesn't worry. Instead, he takes time to explain to us the secret of victory over worry or anxiety. And we've got three things in our text, very simply, a principle. Be anxious for nothing. And a precept. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. And a promise. The peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. First, we've got this principle. As I say in the NIV, this word is translated, and rightly so, anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be full of care. Be careful for nothing. Don't be full of care and anxiety. It's right to have a concern about things. Of course it is. And certain things we do become anxious about. But there's a way to cope and handle anxiety. Anxiety, of course, is a problem of heart and mind. Our thoughts and our feelings are very much involved in anxiety. The Greek word translated anxious or careful means to be of a divided mind. Our feelings pulling us one way and our thoughts pulling us the other way. Uh, this is a situation that sets up in our hearts when we are anxious about things. Fears, fears and, and anxieties, they pull us pull us down. They tear us apart. And indeed, the old English root from which we get the word worry means to, to strangle. And that's what worry does. It chokes the life out of us. We become immobilized through anxiety. And we get into this worried state. The life of faith becomes inoperative. We are victims of circumstances or whatever. We worry. And we worry about all kinds of things. I say circumstances. When things are going well for us, we're all happy enough. And um, we're easier to live with. And we're happier uh, to be with. But have you ever considered that circumstances are always beyond our control? Many circumstances in life. Um, we go on the road daily and we motor. We're not in control of people or drive on the road, that's out of our control. 
We're not in control of the weather. There are multitudes of things in life that we are not in control of. Circumstances. Well, if you depend on ideal circumstances, you're not going to be happy for very long. But because few of us enjoy ideal circumstances. Byron wrote, men are the sport of circumstances. We worry about people. We have no control over people, what they say or what they do. But we have to live and work with them. And uh, we must learn to rub along with them, get along with them. We must be forbearing and kind one to another. In the context of our text, is another word that's changed from the authorized version, the word moderation. It means gentleness, forbearance. We have to be forbearing one with another. We worry then about what people say and what people do. And then again, things. We worry about things. And you think back in life, we have uh, things that have caused us great concern in life. I think of, uh, think of your car, think of the house. We, we think these things are necessary but they do give us a lot of anxiety. There's always something to be concerned about with a vehicle. I remember in my first pastorate in Cardiff, uh, I bought a car, and the car was a very poor car. And it was a car that broke down all over Cardiff. And I had it for a number of years. And um, it was a very uh, Precar precarious thing to go into that car to take a journey. My, my son was always reluctant to go into the car, the youngest lad. And um, the day I took it back to sell it, it back where I had it from, it broke down again. And, but that car was a, a menace. It was a pain in my life, a real cause of concern. And I spent many anxious hours over the car. And see, it's a thing. And the secret is, isn't it, to uh, travel lightly through life, isn't it? The less things we have, the, the less we have to worry about. The more we have, the more we have to worry about. Jesus warns us against worry then. Take no thought for what you shall eat or drink or put on. And Paul follows his master by saying, be anxious for nothing. This has been called the impossible imperative. Don't worry. And that's the directive we're given, or the command we're given in this text. Don't worry, he says. Be anxious for nothing. And it's a problem, as I say, of heart and mind. Our feelings are involved. Something can happen to a loved one, for instance, um, suddenly rushed into hospital and you are concerned. It's no good saying, don't worry, we are concerned. Your heart is involved. You love that person and you're concerned and you... Uh, you, you think and your thoughts have been round in your mind and it's a vicious circle. That's a worry comes about, heart and mind. And we want to get a grip and a control of these things. And to say to be anxious for nothing or don't worry is cold comfort indeed. But Paul doesn't stop there. And we must continue to follow the full statement. Be anxious for nothing but... In everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And here is one of Paul's then great buts. He has many of them. But be anxious for nothing. And it's the but of protestation, of faith. Because what is prayer but faith calling upon God? And that's what he is saying. But pray. The answer to care is prayer. And that's what he's saying. To call upon God. Prayer is faith in action. Paul is saying this to us then. James says a similar thing. He says, is any afflicted? And that word afflicted means, is any under pressure? Let him pray. Let him pray. That's the answer. We are to pray. And uh, you notice the, the contrast. In nothing be anxious... But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. But we are not to worry then about a, con a, a conceivable thing, but we are to take it to God in prayer. And when we are worried, 
what do we do more often than not? Uh, if we go perhaps to our friends first and we pick up the phone when we're in trouble and we pour our heart out to somebody that we know, some friend. And, but the text tells us, let your requests be made known unto God. That's what the text tells us. Put God first. Uh, perhaps God would give us uh, a directive to go to another person, somebody who can give us some counsel about our problem. But first of all, go to God. And if you remember the little word, acts, it's not forcing this text at all to remember these four words. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It's not forcing the text at all because that's exactly what the apostle is saying in this text. Adoration is the first thing. Paul tells us we have to be to pray to God in a certain way. And uh, the word that he uses for prayer is the general word that describes prayer. And that is the word adoration. Our Lord taught us to pray, didn't he? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Adoration. But when we are worried, then what do we do? Do we do, we do this? Do we pray to God? Do we pray about our problem and take our problem to God? But that's not what the text is saying. It's not with my problem I begin. It's with God I begin. And what we need to do when we have got a problem is to go into the presence of God and realize the presence of God. We are going into the presence of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we must realize his presence, first of all. And realize that we're approaching the living God, the sovereign God. Because it's only the sovereignty of God that will give us comfort and peace in the world that we live in. And if you come and look at the passage, he says, Let your requests be made known unto God. And we must remember that our God is a sovereign God. We remember his greatness, his majesty, his power. This is the God we come into when we've got a problem. Do you know, you can pray in such a way. I've heard people pray. And their prayers have sounded like an agonized cry of unbelief. Because they can only see the problem. And they forget God. Instead of lifting their eyes up to the heavens, to Almighty God, we've got a great God. Wonderful God. A God who is able to do above that we ask or think. And we begin to think of our God. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, more tender and loving than any earthly father. And we go to him with our problem. A God who loves us. A God who cares for us. A God who is all wise, who allows things to come into our life, to try us, to test us. Why? To drive us to himself, to bring us unto him, pressed out of measure, pressed into God. That's what one old dear minister told me one, one time in Cardiff, a retired minister. He'd been a, a prisoner in a communist camp in China, and he was in prison, and they wouldn't even give him, not, they wouldn't give him food, but they wouldn't give him water. And his tongue had swollen in his mouth, and it was cracked and bleeding. And I said, David, how did you manage? Pressed out of measure, pressed into God. At that time, God came very near that man and made himself known and granted him the necessary grace, the, the strength and the help that he needed at that time and took him through it. And he lived to a great age. So he came through it. So God helped him in his extremity. Well, then I say again, pressed out of measure, like the Apostle Paul speaks in First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, doesn't he? He, he speaks that he, he despaired of life itself, but he put his faith in God who raised the dead, the all-powerful, almighty God. And, and so we must do the same. God then, as ways of revealing himself unto us, we read about how God is mighty and strong and loving and faithful, but we find it through experience. What you learn by experience is far better than reading a book on theology. It's far better what you know about God experimentally. And that this God answers prayer. 
And uh, this is why it's set down for us in this way then. We've got to allow God to come into the situation in our little lives. And the same in the life of the church. We go to prayer and bring God into the situation. And the situation changes because God is with us. Never to leave us or forsake us. Well, we come then to God. And we come with a second word. uh, A confession. Uh, And the the word, um, it means a felt need. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known unto God. The word supplication is a word which means a felt need. And this is the word Paul uses. And this is the way we are to come before God. Making a request or a petition to God. It means that we have a, a deep sense of inadequacy. There are situations in life we can't cope with. I can't handle this, we say. I just can't handle it. And you feel you're going down under it. And in that situation, we must reach out to God. And thank God, he says in the passage that we read together, he says that he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's his promise. He's promised that for us. And so we come humbly before God. And we we come in a sense of dependency because when we are helpless, we are dependent on another. And then we are dependent on mighty God. And such praying comes from the depths of our being. That's when we pray. That's when you pour your heart out. When you go through deep waters or in great straits, that's when we pray. God is a way of bringing us into this state of mind. And we thank him for it. Because you may have asked God, nonchalantly teach me to pray and we find great difficulties we know uh, there's a hymn which speaks of that I, and, and, and we know uh, Newton's hymn and but so God does through these things and so we come to God you remember the prophet Jonah uh, we read of Jonah in chapter 2 it begins like this then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly I cried by reason of mine affliction. What happened? Well, Jonah was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach against it, concerning their wickedness. But Jonah rebelled, and he went down to Tarshish, and he found a ship, and he tried to run away from God. Not from the omnipresence of God. He had enough theology to know he couldn't run from the presence of God. But it tells us that he fled from the presence of the Lord. That was the felt presence of God. He he fled from communion with God and broke communion with God. And God had to deal with him. And there may be somebody like that here tonight. I don't know. But God will certainly deal with you if you're a backslider. And he dealt with Jonah. And he sent a storm into his life. And then he was swallowed by a great fish. We know the story. And when he was down there in the belly of the fish, God pursued his servant. He had a mission for him. And he had to fulfill that commission. He had to fulfill it. And God restored him in a wonderful way. It was then in the belly of the fish where one would think that you would die in despair in such a situation. He begins to cry to God. And if you read chapter 2, you'll see in that prayer, he's praising God before he comes out of the belly of the fish and thanking God for a deliverance. Isn't that wonderful? What faith can do. Faith, you see, you can push it down into the depths of that. It'll always come up. It'll always come to the surface if you've got true faith, Christian faith. Well, that's what happened to Jonah, and he's got a way of doing that to us. God can put us sometimes on our back, if it's necessary, to look up. And so he brings us into great straits and great trial, like, like poor old Jonah. God does Uh, many ways to make us feel our weakness and to reach out for him, to exchange our weakness for his strength. As he not promised in Isaiah, fear not, thou worm, Jacob. There's nothing more vulnerable than a worm. And this is what God calls us at times. Worms uh, uh, can be torn apart. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. I will help thee. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Remember, those whom he loveth, he chasteneth. 
and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Thank God for divine interference. Divine interference in the first place. When he came to us and we were apprehended of Christ Jesus, he took hold of our lives. That's how we are saved. God coming to us. God saving us. Salvation is the work of God. And he comes to us and brings us into the kingdom. That's how, that's how we are saved. And we see it as that when we are converted and we go on with the Lord and we think, how did we get those thoughts that first came to us? Well, God came to us, didn't he? And he saved us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say tonight that uh, maybe you're not a Christian and uh, you were feeling, I say this word, felt need. Well, you were feeling your need and you may be keenly feeling your need. As a Christian, feeling that you're full of sin and you are worthless and helpless. And what can you do? Well, same thing as Jonah did. Cry unto the Lord. Same as thing as we all did. Cry unto the Lord. If you have a deep sense of sin and unworthiness, then repent of your sin and trust Christ for salvation. And go to the Lord Jesus Christ in the words of that beautiful hymn which says, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. God help you if you've never prayed that prayer, to call upon the Lord, because he has promised whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful statement that is. Whosoever. It's a broad word, isn't it? Whosoever. Whoever it may be. Whosoever shall call. That's a simple word, isn't it? To call upon the Lord. Even a baby can cry out to its mother. You can call upon the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a sure word. That's a sure word. Shall be saved. Cry to him and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, for Jesus' sake. For without calling upon the Lord, there's no salvation unless you call. Yes, it's God's work, but he, he works in our hearts and makes us willing in the day of his power. God help you to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ if you've never called upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the third word he uses is thanksgiving. And what an important word this is in prayer. Thanksgiving. If we have a grudge against God, how can we thank him? Some of us have gone through very bitter experiences. And we don't envy those experiences some people have gone through. We feel deeply for them. But we must, be, we must guard against bitterness. I remember an old pastor telling me, Colin, one thing I've always prayed for is a sweet spirit. God keep us sweet. And we don't become embittered. And uh, we can't come to God with thankfulness if we've got a grudge against God or a grudge against anyone else. Uh, these two people in our text that we mentioned in the context of our text, uh, they couldn't come to God with thanksgiving. Eudius uh, and Syntyche, they can't come to verses 6 and 7. They can't come with any kind of confidence and gratitude with the problem they had in their life. They had to sort it out first. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, and so they had to repent. And there are certain conditions for prayer, and we must fulfill those conditions. If you would have your prayer answered, well, what are we to thank God for? So many things. We've been speaking about salvation, past mercies. God saved us. God gave us the gift of faith and repentance. He saved us. He gave us eternal life. He gave us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What can we say to that? Thanks. The Apostle Paul said that. Thanks be unto God. For his unspeakable gift. I can't put it into words, Paul said. How precious Jesus is to me. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness then. Thankfulness takes bitterness against God out of our hearts. 
It overrides the temptation to think that God doesn't care. God cares. And we should be thankful to God. We have past mercies, present mercies, future mercies, a glorious hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. One day to be in heaven. Shouldn't we be a people who thank God, who has delivered us from the miseries of hell and who has prepared a place for us in heaven? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there he may be also. We have every reason to thank God. We have every reason, like Paul, to rejoice in the Lord always. He saved us. You can always rejoice about that. I'm saved. God is good, whatever happens to us. Thank God. He's a good God. He's a wise God, loving God, a kind God. We can't say enough about him, can we? He's a wonderful God. And, you know, we come to God in this way and we pour our heart out to God, but Let's, let's come to the last word. And uh, I, I say, I'm using the word supplication, but what's happening in this little prayer, in this, what's set down for us here, is moving from the general to the particular. You remember I said, not with my burden I begin, it's with God I begin. That's good biblical psychology. Always begin with God. Think. He tells us in this chapter, think of these things. Think of God. And look at your problem through God. Don't look at God through your problem, because your God will be a little God. But God is a big God, and look at your little problem to God. God can help you. God can strengthen you. God can enable us. And so what's happening in this text is coming down to specifics. To, yes, now mention the problem. After you've worshipped God, remembered what kind of God he is, then come down to the specific definite specific and this is what he's saying here Uh, very often we are too vague in our prayers what do you want what are we praying about tell him specifically even if it's a little problem take it to him not to get anxious over over it we think sometimes well i can handle these little things you can come unstuck with little things because big things depend on little things come to god and tell him your problem in everything everything by prayer that's what the text tells us and if you read the life of king david you read about king david like this in this david sought not the lord and he inevitably got into trouble and then you read then again about good king david in this he sought the lord god help us then in this always to seek the lord Always to seek the Lord in every problem, little and great problems. In everything, seek the face of the Lord. But there's not much time left, but let me touch on the promise because it's such a wonderful promise. The promise, the peace of God shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Now, if we pray in this definite, specific way, something wonderful happens. That's what the text is telling us. The peace of God shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. God answers prayer. He has done so so many times for some of us. Like the psalmist in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all my troubles. And that's our testimony. Time and time again in our lives, we've met, the Lord has met with us. God promises to meet all our needs. We've already quoted it. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Call upon me, he says. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer thee. Well, what I want us to remember in this, and it's so important. The peace of God shall keep your heart and mind. If you pray like this, something wonderful happens to us and in us. The Christian life is doctrine. Yes. History, doctrine, experience, practice, those four things. But it's experimental. God comes to us and gives us this peace, the peace of God which passes all understanding. And you may have been praying about something, but before your prayers are answered, you are answered. That's what the text is telling us. We are answered. What we need is the peace of God. 
And the New Testament teaching is, time and again, is to enable us to cope with the trials and temptations of life. Like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He prayed for the thorn in the flesh to be removed. And he prayed three times. And God didn't remove the thorn in the flesh. He didn't answer his prayer. No, but he answered the Apostle, my grace is sufficient for thee. That's God's way to give us his peace. He answers you. What you need is peace. What you need is Christ to come to you and manifest himself to you. When you pray in this way, and this is our way to go to God, this peace, this peace of God, this peace of God which passeth all understanding. Paul was in prison. He remained in prison. He had the peace of God, though. He had the peace of God. And he tells us, and he tells them how to get the peace of God, how to maintain the peace of God. The peace which, is, which Christ has procured for us. The peace of God which passeth all understandings. Problems may remain, but now filled with the peace of God, we're able to face the trials and temptations of life. Paul remained in prison. And we, uh, you would have prayed about that. And we may have the problems that we prayed about and nothing happened. But we've known the peace of God enabling us to cope. The peace of God which passes all understanding. What kind of peace is that? Well, in the words of the Scotsman, better felt than tell. It's a wonderful peace that God gives to us in our hour of need. We experience. And it's subjective. It's peace through the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. There is the peace of justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But when we, Paul isn't talking about that. He's talking about subjective peace. He's talking about our condition, not our standing before God. Peace within is subjective peace. The very peace of God himself, he communicates that. It's a communicable attribute. The peace of God. Of God filling our hearts and minds when we go to him in this way. The peace of God that passes all understanding, better felt than felt. More for, uh, it's, uh, it's beyond then comprehension. Uh, and it doesn't belong to the elite. It's to the least Christian. Every Christian is promised this. And he goes on to say that it garrisons the heart. It guards the heart. The Philippians were accustomed to see Roman soldiers stationed on important points in front of buildings and so on to protect them. And the people inside, if the soldiers were there, they were safe. And if we have the peace of God within, well, whatever happens without, we can cope with. God will help us by manifesting this peace to us, keeping, guarding, Heart and mind, because that's where the problem arises. Our thoughts and our feelings. God's our thoughts and our feelings. And we rejoice in the Lord. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. We're all in the school of Christ. We're all learning how to live the Christian life, how to practice the Christian life, how to experience the Christian life. We're learners. And we are learning these things. God help us to put the word of God into practice. It's a command. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. The prophet Isaiah of old said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace who trusteth in thee. Amen.